Okay, here we go. <coughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> That's how we're going to start off. Uh, good evening, everybody. We're back for another Animal Talk. Uh, we are talking tonight about Nutria. Nutria are one of those animals that you don't hear a lot about unless you do. And I'm going to explain that a little bit. So with Nutria, they are they're an animal that is not native to North America. So they're, very, they're in very select parts more or less. Um, big populations are down in Texas and Louisiana, uh, as well as getting basically the whole Gulf Coast area is where they are. They are a, um, a semi-aquatic rodent. So anywhere there's water, that's where they'll be. And predominantly, they'll, st they'll stick mainly with fresh water. So you find them more on river mouths. Yes, they'll be where the ocean kind of brushes up with the shoreline but that's where the animals predominantly tend to habitate. Um, and because of the fact that they are a non-native animal, they have been an absolute detriment to the environment that they're in. Um, Louisiana, it's, uh, Louisiana has lost half a mile of Delta shoreline to these animals because they have gone in and just obliterated the plant life in that area. They are um, predominantly herbivorous, so they eat plants, roots, and stalk material, anything that can stop erosion from happening with the waterways. And these guys just wipe it out. Uh, you can you can see the amount of damage that has happened, like through time progressing um, satellite images of the coastline for where these guys habitate. Uh, they are found in Texas too. Um, a lot of people call these swamp rats because uh, they are originally from South America. They prefer the wetlands uh, in that region um, where they're naturally called koipu. That is actually the correct name for these is the koipu. Uh, nutria is just what we have termed them to be. Um, they are bigger than a muskrat. Um, they can be anywhere from 15 to 25 pounds on the larger end. So they, they tend to dwarf a muskrat, which can be a few pounds, maxing up to about eight. Um, actually, I'll log that for another talk another for a different day. Um, but they do habitate similar environments where they will burrow into big signs. Uh, the picture, this is a nutria. This is also what is called a koipu, uh, is the original name for them. Uh, the big difference between them and other animals is a few specific things on their uh, on their physiology. Phys they look different because their body different. So, uh, the big thing is actually if you see on the snout, it's white. They I call them a uh, it's like a white mustache. It's going to be right at the nose down to the upper lip. That whole zone is going to be bright white. Um, not not many other animals actually have that on their face. When they're swimming, it's hard to tell the difference between them, a muskrat, and a beaver. So that's kind of one of the big signature uh, differences between them. The other is the tail. They actually have a big, round rat tail, as opposed to a beaver, which has a thick, wide uh, slap tail, if you will, or flat tail. That's another term that people give for beavers. But with nutria... The problem with them is that they are incredibly prolific. These breed almost nonstop. Um, I had a note here for their breeding rate. Uh, they breed incredibly fast. Uh, four months gestation period. Um, and they can have anywhere between two and 13 offspring per litter. Per litter. That is a lot of animals, and they will do it three times a year. They breed rapidly out of control in terms of what our ecosystem can naturally handle. Yes, they are from South America originally. Um, they were brought up to North America in the uh, late 1800s for the fur industry. Part of it is because of that breeding. They breed incredibly fast, their fur quality is almost as good as a beaver. A little thinner, but not as bad. It still has the waterproof capability, has a decent texture to it, 
all the more reason to have it because they breed so fast and so f and um, so prolifically they make a great alternative in terms of a farm beaver fur situation beaver will only give birth once a year anywhere from two to three in a litter so you can see how the the draw of an animal that can reproduce very quickly and rapidly works very well for that the problem was the fur market crashed in the um, 1930s 1940s um, and so what ended up happening these animals they basically they didn't know what to do with them they basically just let them go wherever the fur farms were they just let them go and that was it basically said well let nature figure it out the problem is they adapted very very well to the environments that we have available to them so basically uh, you're gonna find them for the most part southern half of South America they're all throughout those wetlands they have been introduced not just to North America but they're in areas of Europe there's a small section of Africa as well as Japan has a lot of them over there too um, let's see do, 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 do. when were they introduced to those regions I'll have to find that one in a little bit uh, but with the with these guys they are um, they're in the, where I am uh, Western Washington near the uh, uh, Lake Washington by Seattle um, I have caught and gotten rid of these animals in several different areas they're in different wetland city environments and they you can tell when they've been by because shoreline banks are just bare even the grass struggles to keep up with these animals these where they are it works very well for that environment very lush waterways with plenty of plant life that don't need to impact the ecosystem nearly as much where they are up here it is devastating it is absolutely devastating the damage that they do um down south different states have actually offered bounties with these uh, anywhere from three to eight dollars a tail for nutria and that's literally how people make their living they'll go out catch trap remove a couple hundred in a week and they'll make their money they'll make their living off of them and they'll eat them i mean any animal can be eaten when prepared properly <laughs> i feel like we'll have to discuss recipes another day uh, but with the nutria they are they have predators uh, down south in south america they do have caiman um, their large predator animals will hunt and eat them around here we have some that will take them um, predominantly the mountain lions coyotes wolves if they ever make them back way back to the area bears will sometimes get after them but predominantly uh, humans are and occasionally otters otters will go after the young but that's about it they don't they really don't have a lot of competition similar to beaver the difference is beaver don't reproduce nearly as fast as these guys do so that's some of the bigger problems that we end up running into with nutria um the last time i encountered these guys was uh, on lake washington when you're one of the northern areas by a city called kenmore i had a whole colony of these had burrowed in underneath an in-ground concrete pool and they had dug it out so badly that the pool was actually starting to cave in and seep all the pool water out uh, into the ground because these guys had burrowed it out so terribly i ended up catching and removing 13 of them from one location that is absolutely ridiculous for the and this was in less than a three-week period um, for me removing all the way up to the full-grown uh, leading adults down to the youngest kit they were all completely mobile they all could run around and follow and they, they develop incredibly quickly um, as for size like I said they can be anywhere from 15 to 25 pounds uh, their bodies aren't massive they are fairly large but they are a little smaller than a porcupine um, they can be anywhere from 18 to 24 inches the tail adds another foot to a foot and a half on their body so they can go from this big to much bigger um 
the big problem with them, especially near um, farmlands, is actually the fact that they, uh, because they burrow, I want to do this with my screen here real quick, because I've got my notes on one side. Uh, because they reproduce and or not because they re because they burrow into bank sides and they can cause the shoreline to cave in and what ends up happening is you get people that have cattle sheep horses whatever even people uh, walking along these bank edges where these animals are you run the risk of stepping on it and the ground collapsing out from underneath you and you just for animals that's a broken leg and that's kind of a dooming sentence for them at that point. Um, where most most animals are like, yeah, you can usually save them if the leg's broken, but if it's too bad of a break, the animal is better off being put down. Now I'll leave that up to a veterinarian and we can discuss that any day of the week, but that's, that's the problems that we run into with these animals. Um, the other thing with, the, with how fast these animals can breed, they can literally breed within days of giving birth to their litter. They become virulent <laughs> immediately. So when it talk, talks about an animal that just breeds and breeds and breeds, these are it. They're probably the largest prolific rodents that breed in the world, next to rats, which can they can do every three. Kurt, help me out here. Rats can breed how often? Every two months? I'm trying to, I'm blanking on this a little bit, because I'm not in my notes. Three weeks. Yep. <laughs> I'll, don't worry. I'll hit the dartboard somewhere. <laughs> I know a lot, but I, I still need notes to coach myself on different things. Um, yes, rats beat them by a good mile. But when it comes to a larger animal, you can't. there's very few things that breed as fast, if not faster, than these. It, usually when you get a much smaller animal, they breed at a much faster rate because they die so quickly. These guys being as big as they are, they, uh, they unnecessarily breed way too fast. They just do. Um, but yeah, they, they prefer fresh water. They'll take salt water. Um, the funny thing about them, and this is with all rodents, um, let me find a good picture here. Their teeth are actually really fascinating. Let's see. Oh, that's got a name on it. I don't want to steal somebody's work. Um, actually, I'll just get a beaver skull up because it just it does the same thing. It, it it'll make the same point and purpose here. No, not that folder there. Okay, give me one second here. I want to put a picture up. Just so you can see. Okay, so this is this is a beaver skull, but this also helps paint a picture for a nutria or most rodent skulls. They all have a similar physiological uh, shape, where it has the two large uh, top and bottom incisors. These are what they use for chewing on literally everything. For beaver, it's chewing on trees bark, limbs, leaves, all of it. Nutria are similar. They just don't have the, uh, they don't have the strength to go after trees the same way a beaver does. So, but with these teeth, the reason they're orange is because all rodent teeth have a level of iron inside those teeth. That's what makes them so strong. They actually have iron inside their teeth and that's what causes that oxidation or that orange rusty look to it is because of the iron content in their teeth. And so with Nutria, you can actually see that sticking out of their lip because they can basically close their mouth and keep chewing. Uh, naked mole rats do something similar with this because they then, then they don't eat the, uh, the dirt that they're digging through. But that's a mole rat, not a, not a aquatic rat. Uh, but with the with these animals, you're always going to see that to the, the, the buck teeth of the uh, incisor sticking out on a nutria. And it's very, very prominent on their face, especially when they look up. You can see the top teeth at the very least sticking out. But as you can see with their teeth, they're absolutely designed for herbivorous lifestyle, big grinders, big molars. Uh, one thing that um, most rodents will do, especially with nutria, is they'll do what's called girdling. 
Girdling is when they strip the bark off of a tree for the first foot from the ground up. They'll strip the bark all around it. Now, they basically will go as far as they can reach. But if it's a small enough plant, they will literally eat it all the way down to a nub. Just down to nothing. And they can do this almost overnight. Um, oh yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely insane what they can do it. And with rodent teeth, there's a thing called the Mohs Hardness Scale. That's basically how they rate diamonds. That's how, how dense and how tough diamonds are. Um, rodent teeth are a fraction stronger than steel. So they can actually chew through metal. It just takes them a long, long time. Um, most of the time, it's if they can't get the angle. Because as you see how the teeth have that curve, it's if they get to a flat surface, you can almost use tin foil. As long as they can't get their teeth on an edge, they can't go through it. Now, again, that's tin foil. And again, their teeth have to get that purchase. But if it's a strong enough, smooth enough surface, they can't chew through it. And that's the big difference with uh, these, with rats, mice, and the like. Bigger animals like this, they have a lot more power, a lot more versatility of what they can get to. Uh, they just can't get to the tiny places that um, like mice and rats can get to. But with uh, beaver and nutria, beaver will literally just take the whole thing off. Nutria wear it, chew it down, and they eat the whole thing. It's not like where a beaver will store it and whatnot. They, these guys eat it immediately. Um, I had a house in, along Lake Washington, which is where most of these problems come from, at least for my service area in Washington. Uh, there was one house, big, big ex-CEO, retired, multimillionaire person. They lost their entire garden overnight. And we're talking ten, fifteen thousand dollar garden, poof, gone. All their 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 little flower plants, the ivy got cut back. So many different things just vanished when a group of these animals came in, came ashore, and just ate, just ate everything. They ate the leaves, the vines, the branches, the bark, all of it. The bushes were destroyed. Uh, they had to be completely replaced. The um, the ferns were ruined. There was these guys did so so much damage. It was insane. Um, but that's some of, that's just some of the stuff that these guys can do. Uh, a lot of people uh, will go out hunt and eat the nutria. That is actually pretty common in the uh, southern state areas. The reason that's the case is because there's just so many of them. Um, but these guys they can be found. Oh, the range is further, they got further than I thought. They're basically from Texas to Florida, all along that coastline. They're, every state that touches that area, the Gulf Coast, they are there. That is, there's where Nutria are. Um, if you want a really cool um, net, uh, uh, documentary to check out, it's called R-O-U-S, Rodents of Unusual Size. It's actually a Discovery Channel documentary about Nutria. And it paints that whole picture of, uh, I actually know one of the guys features in it, Michael Barron. Um, he was the one contracted by this, one of, he's one of the city contractors to remove the nutria from the canals and dikes that are in that area. Um, they've made it up to, no, that can't be right. What? So... I'm looking at the map for the Nutria, and you can find this on Wikipedia. Um, the map for them, they're definitely down in Oregon and in Western Washington. Um, it looks like there's some in Idaho, in Mon no, Colorado. But there's one area in the Midwest here that I'm trying to figure out exactly where they are. It's like Indi Southern Indiana, Kentucky, maybe? Oh man, I gotta, I gotta figure this one out here. That's news to me. It's news. It's new news. I love new news. Um, Nutria spread in North America. Do 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 do. When was this put out? 
got a document here from Fish and Wildlife Services. Ooh, as of 2012, it looks like they have made their way up to Ohio and all the way up, uh, the, uh, all the way up the Mississippi to the southern tip of Illinois. They're up in Oklahoma. They're in Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia. Um, this is this is nuts. These animals are just going everywhere. And this was a this is a map from 2012. Holy cow! So yes, they are in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, all along the waterways. Not surprising, but yes, they're all along the waterways. Uh, California is getting inundated with them. I remember reading an article for uh, Southern California where they were trying to figure out the best method of dealing with these animals of whether they want to open bounties on them or not. Um, and there's a lot of pushback. I mean, California does have the patterns of very progressive... How can I say this politely? Because I really don't want to talk politics too hard. It's very... So this is where we're going to come, we're going to butt heads with folks of emotion versus science. The science says that these do not belong in our ecosystem. They are actually being very they are very dangerous to the ecosystem. And the emotion is save every animal. This is a this is a discussion of of management. This is animal management at its core. This has nothing to do with whether we want to treat the animals right. This is what's best for the ecosystem. And that's all I'll have arguments with folks on that every day of the week. Uh, I'm actually going to put a link here in the chat. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Progressive and trendsetting state. Okay, there we go. That's a good way of saying it. Um, let's see. They're actually... They have actually been added to the uh, <coughs> the invasive species, USDA invasive species list. Here we go. I'm going to put this in the chat here for anybody that wants to um, take a look at it later. But these guys, if they've been added to the invasive species list, I don't know what else to tell you other than the fact that they there needs to be a program to completely remove them from the ecosystem. Now, I will absolutely petition against the use of any um, environmental de environmentally detrimental means. I think some of the states have the right ideas with opening up bounties on these guys, but that's kind of what it all comes down to. Uh, it's just what is going to be the best and most effective is really what it comes down to. So, okay, I'm going to change our Pictor back here to our uh, creature of discussion. So, um, but yeah, this is what I say. With the face, it's that white mustache is the big giveaway for a nutria. So, with the let's see, yeah, they're all aphis is also calling them invasive. Everybody, invasive invader. They're just they. Oh, <laughs> okay. It's, uh, where did that go? Oh, there was something I just, that popped, and I just, it just made me chuckle. Um, in most Spanish-speaking countries, the word nutria refers primarily to otter. There, there's, there you, there's something, new information for you. Um, the name Nutria is, na is used primarily through North America, Asia, and some countries of the Soviet Union. Most Spanish-speaking companies, it's, uh, Nutria refers, refers predominantly to the otter. To avoid this ambiguity, the name Coipu or Coi Coipo um, is used in Latin America and parts of Europe. In France, the Coipu is known as Rabindin. Giant water rat, I guess. <laughs> in Dutch, it is known as beaver rat or beaver rat. Oh, I love this. Um, but they're all just basically summation of the name is that it is a giant water rat, and that's really what they do. Um, there was there was a way that they dealt with them. A long, a long time ago, and I think they're still allowed to use it, but it is a, it is a federally regulated substance 
called zinc phosphate. Um, it is very, it's what we call in the um, chemical world as very hot. It is, it is a, if handled improperly, it is a dangerous substance and will kill a human if mishandled. Uh, but a lot of times they'll make feeding areas that have this zinc phosphate basically floated right to where the nutria are. So they try to keep the collateral out as much as possible. Now I can't agree with the methodology in terms of using um, hot chemicals or products like this. I'm very, much, I'm a firm believer in body collection because it stops cross contamination. Um, that's why I think the bounty system would be really good for dealing with nutria. So with these guys, basically, they go up, they eat whatever substance, whatever food has the zinc phosphate substance on it, it kills them incredibly fast. So it works very effectively on a wide scale of terms of like a quick turnaround and a removal of an invasive species. The problem is, is because it's so hot and can be very dangerous if mishandled, it can lead to some catastrophic effects. And I, I believe me, you can just look up on any Google or any kind of talk of mishandling of chemical and the ramifications that come from it that's there's billions of stories out there drink your water who's got their water i want to hear in chat who's got their water because water is essential water's good for you i don't care what anybody says and just water that doesn't have nutria in it it'd be preferred <laughs> Um, but yeah, with Dutria, they will, uh, they'll take over. In pest control industry, we tend to use chemical as a last resort. No, that is the, that is the proper response. It is, it should be a dead last ringer of a response. Good on you for having your water. Excellent. Everybody should always have their water. But it's, you just want to look up some of the damage that these guys can do. It is absolutely insane i definitely i do suggest that uh, uh i do suggest that uh um documentary about holy cow uh about rodents of unusual size that is absolutely something i suggest for people to check out So, okay, here is, okay, here's a picture of some damage of what you can find from um, nutria, of what can happen to the landscape if they're left to be unchecked. And like I say, this is predominantly for what they're native to, works very well for that. Um, so basically, you can see in the background, the remains or what is considered a normal marsh. And you can see everything that's been cut down to the water level, and that's what these guys will, will eat. Um, I need to read a little more about what this, but I believe that enclosure is basically just as a thing of um, what they're showing to try to save. Like that's a comparison of what it should be at versus what it is at from the damage that these animals have done. Yeah, that's what it is. Um, so basically, they just chew everything down to the root system, and so it just can't grow. And that's where we end up losing, like the Louisiana Delta, as losing literally hundreds of feet of coastline because it just keeps getting washed away. That's where the deltas and marshes and bogs come in really well. And if we don't do things to keep bait nature balanced, this is what can happen. I mean, yes, they've been, it's been hundreds of years not hundreds. God, I'm not that old yet. God. Um, it's born in 85. Shut up. The, um, I say hundreds of years when it was 19, 19, 1880s and 90s is when they were brought in for the fur market. And so with the, and this is what can happen if they're just left to be unchecked. So they've been in North America for a little over 100 years, but that doesn't mean that they've naturalized not realistically, because the predator, um, waiting on pizza. I had pizza yesterday. I was quite happy with it. I actually made my own pizza. What is this? Oh, text message. Get back to that later. 
Um, what was I going on about? Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so basically, you can just you can, there's so much damage that these guys have done. Um, I want to get coastline lost. Ha! Here we go. Louisiana, for example, has lost. It's kind of the same as lionfish. They are teaching pred other predators to eat them because of the dimentation. Yeah, no, it's just like with the lionfish. Um, you just got to get the right predators to deal with it. The problem is that if you get the root, too many predators, um, excess food causes excess population. I'll, and that is that is a that is a fact of nature every time. So we will run into other issues depending on what predator. Because I don't think we're going to be bringing caiman or crocodiles to eat the nutria from the areas of, that the caiman and all like are. Uh, Oh my gosh, stop that. Endemic to. Um, we had 25 square miles of coastland each year from 1983 to 1990. That has been lost in Louisiana. That is insane. The amount of damage that has been done. It is, oh my gosh. I'm trying to see. Yeah, I, and there's the other thing with Katrina. Um, the hurricane that went through, they, that did great for wiping out, oh my gosh, the 2005 to 2006 trapping season, which normally runs from November to March, yielded 168,000 nutria tails. The 2009 to 2010 set a record at 445,000 tails according to the state that is oh my gosh that is absolutely insane for that many animals to be removed and they're still it's getting worse it is just continually getting worse as uh more states uh, more things are done to add regulations um Yeah, they're basically saying a whole square mileage is unrecoverable uh, land damage because of these animals. And that just, that breaks my heart. It really does. Um, I've been to those areas. I've checked out. I've gone to some of those marshlands, and they were absolutely gorgeous to go check out. So it's just really, really hard when you hear about these different things with the damage. I mean, it's our fault. It is all our fault as humans. Um, that is 100% true. Because we created it, it's our job to fix it properly. And I will I will stand on that rock until the day I die. The same rock as don't feed wildlife. They don't need our help. I got a lot of rocks I stand on. Let's see. There's a couple subspecies, but they're all basically the exact same thing. Um, they are... Um, what is this? They're close to beavers in what's called the Myocastorini uh, tribe. So it went, it's uh, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, subfamily, and tribe, and then genus, which is uh, Myocastor, or M-Y-O castor. And then you get to the species name. Uh, but they have basically, they're closely related to beaver in that effect because they have a type of castor gland similar to uh, beavers which actually have the castorium excrement or excretion uh, which is, comes from the castor gland so they have the same um, same attributes that's the word I was looking for as a beaver would as well um, yeah it's just these these guys their fur quality isn't bad I will absolutely attest to that it made perfectly good sense as to why they were brought in it's just painful that the fur market was demonized as bad as, bad as it was. You know, and I, and I really shouldn't get into that kind of talk right now. This is, we're talking about the animals. I don't want to be pushing my politics about um, what's best for the environment and everything. All I know is I'm going off of the evidence that I can see clearly set in front of me. And with this explicit picture of normal marsh 
denuded, uh, denuded marsh and what was there, that paints a very clear picture of what these animals can do to their environment. And this was something, this is very similar to what it looked like at that property over uh, by Lake Washington. And these guys, they, they are there and they are here to stay and it is my job to try to get them resolved for whatever properties they come up to. So, and that's the hard part. Um, unfortunately with Nutria, I don't have a ton of stories at least not for me in particular. If I get some other, uh, my hope is to get a couple other guys that do this work onto some of these talks in order to um, to do this and to be able to see um, other perspectives because I don't have armadillo. I don't deal with iguana. I don't deal with um, the American alligator. I would love to get some of those guys on here to talk about it too. But is the damage they do only considered damage because of human involvement? Wouldn't they just do this kind of thing in the wild and then be eaten off by predators or move on? Yes. So here's the thing. Yes and no is because of human involvement. We brought them to these environments that they are not suited for. Um, I don't know if you were here for my talk about how fast they breed, but they breed three times a year with a litter of up to 13 in a litter. That is catastrophically high for our ecosystem in North America. We don't have the predator base to keep up with those numbers. These are originally from South America, where yes, it would just be a typical thing because they have the more established predatory animals than we do. Um, yes, we have caused our own problems of wiping out some of our own predators, but yes, in the wild, they do have areas that are designed for what's called an eat out. An eat out is basically where they go in, wipe out a whole area, some die off because of starvation. This is the same thing for muskrats. And then they move on and find new territory. But that ecosystem is able to maintain and regrow from that damage. Um. <laughs> uh. No, we should have kept spaying and neutering these ones is what should have happened. But the problem is their lifelines aren't, aren't long enough. Um, but yes, in the wild, this would be the correct thing for them to deal with in the wild. Where they're from, which is the southern half of South America. It is... Buzz, 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 buzz. Marvel or DC? Oh. For asking about what comics I prefer. Um... But yes, this is this is pretty typical of what they would do in their ecosystem, but our plants just aren't able to survive from that level of damage. Whereas a lot of the plants that they feed on down in South America, they can survive and continue to regrow in those areas. And the ecosystem just works for it. Um, actually, down in South America, they're dealing with beavers as a problem. They were actually, same idea, brought down to South America as a... Um, is a fur thing, but they also just ended up getting translocated or yeah, translocated to that environment. And they're wreaking havoc on the natural riverways where these guys need to be. Because they flood the land so much, it kills the plants that can't be sustained. So you can see where this whole thing becomes a very delicate balancing act of when something gets either introduced or completely removed from the ecosystem. Um, with these nutria down in Louisiana, you can see square miles of just mud where there were plants and where there was like an actual thriving ecosystem it's just mud now because it's causing the delta to wash away like literally wash away and that is and that's the hard part is there's then the fact of like what's the best way to go about dealing with it there's a whole bunch of different things that can be done like i was saying zinc phosphate and i'm very against that because of how much of a risk there is with that. Um, bounty systems are really good because it actually gets the general populace involved and it actually is a way for um, the state to get what they want and give a small reward. And that's, that's not much, that's not too difficult for it. Yeah, calling the herd is a, is a big thing about that too. They do that in so many different state parks. You get too many animals that um, the predators just can't keep up with. They got to do what they need to to allow to keep it, keep that balance. I'm not a religious person, but it's always been said that humans are the stewards of the planet, and that's that's what we're here to do. Let's let's actually take care of it. <laughs> but we got to put a regulation on it and make it a fine. And if you don't do it the right way, uh, 
no politics. We don't want to do politics here. Um, but yes, we've got. There's a lot of things that could be done different to help make this a better situation than what it is. Um, and guys like me are a big factor in that, especially when um, you get them digging out the levees and canals down in the southern states, like uh, Louisiana, Alabama, and Texas. They all have their different canal systems, and there's still plenty of pasture land down there for cattle, sheep, and all the whole lot of it. These guys just do nothing but cause problems. They really do. I mean, granted, that's viewed as interference with human lifestyle for causing those problems. Um, the problem is there's no natural checks or balances. And that's that's where we got to step in at that point. Uh, some of these subjects are just going to get to me a little bit. <laughs> Uh, but this was this was actually really cool. I'm super happy I found this picture. Hey, there's a thought. Drink water. I'll have to find that little thing. I think I have to get more... Um, yes, wolves are always the answer, especially when you para-drop wolves um, to help take care of the elk problem. That's probably... That's something I remember. They actually did have an initiative with beaver where they trapped put them in crates and airdrop them, like parachute drop them into the wilds of either Idaho or Montana. Or where was that? <sighs> parachute beavers. This was in the 1940s. Yeah, uh, Idaho, parachuting beavers in. This is the funniest thing I have ever seen. Where they actually parachute... Oh, let's see. No, that's a video. I want a picture. I want a picture of them parachuting these beavers in. This is hilarious. Here it is. <laughs> you guys are going to like this one. Hang on. I'm gonna, let me put this up here. Oh. i got to find faster ways to do this. There. They actually have <laughs> beavers put into crates and parachute dropped into the wilds of Idaho. So you just, yes, yeah, send in the beavers. That's, <laughs> there's a video thing, um, uh, a video documentary of it. Um, the 1940s is when this happened. Um, let's see here. Stop that. They took surplus parachutes after World War II to use and drop these beavers into Idaho. Oh my gosh, this is fantastic. I love the kookiness that we can come up with. <laughs> Axes and beaver. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. This is some of the kooky stuff that, um, that we've just done to make things work. Like like I said, airlifting the wolves in to help with the elk and moose population. Airdropping beaver in to help with creating better uh, floodplains. Let's see. Okay, yeah, they were having problems with keeping the beaver population stable in Idaho, so they had to parachute in. <sighs> they parachuted in. <laughs> <laughs> yes, your taxpayer money at work. Oh my gosh. I, I, I'm not going to lie. If they had more eccentric ideas like this happening with the U.S. government, I would absolutely allow them to do this. This is 100% fantastic. And it would not, it would literally not fly in today's political climate. But this is fantastic for the different things that they do. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, this is great. <laughs> oh. Yeah, no, there, you, you can just look at, like, you can see the crates that they used. They had specifically made so that when they landed, it was it would break open and allow the beavers to actually climb out. It was, it is so goofy. Um, oh my gosh. And of course, there's the Photoshop beaver on a parachute. Flying in. Oh my gosh. 
the stuff people come up with on these things. The stuff our government comes up with. All of the e the emu war. Yes, I will have to talk about the emu war. Um, I can think of a couple places I would have beavers airdropped. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh! Actually, that is a good place. If there was an animal that could actually benefit from being in a different ecosystem, where would it be? Um, that's a good question, actually. Hmm. Well, I definitely think we could do with more alligators down to help deal with the nutria going on. Um, and at the same time, I feel like that. Uh, that would be a catastrophic situation altogether. Okay, we're just going to switch back here to our main talking point. Because um, I know I know Coyote definitely could do with some work on different things. I know there's a bunch of things that could be done differently. Hmm. Nutria have also made it to Maryland. They made it to the East Coast. Oh, Maryland's East Shore has seen thousands of acres of protected marshland impacted by Nutria's destructive feeding habits. The Chesapeake Bay Nutria Eradication Project began in 2002 to remove the invasive Nutria from the marshes. Did they succeed? <laughs> That's the biggest question. Oh... I have issues with my jaw now and again. But yeah. Um, so that's that's kind of my talk on Nutria. I've touched on everything I can think of and what I can find about them. Um, so what do you guys think? Any What are your thoughts about uh, what animal should I be doing on a Friday? Because what I'm going to do, Tuesday is something I'll pick the subject on. Kind of make it something a little more obscure like the Nutria. Um, what's a subject we could talk about this coming Friday? Because I want Fridays to be something you guys submit for a subject. Uh, we could talk about the coyotes. We could talk about the emu war that happened down in Australia. That is actually a fantastic story um, about the emu war. Where it, it, it is just some of the goofiest... Oh, stop yawning. Oh my gosh, stop it. Uh -huh. The emu war is some of the goofiest nonsense I've ever heard of. And that's because we lost. We humans lost the emu war. And it is absolutely an epic story. And it's going to need my whole time next time to do it. Let's see. What else was there in the chat? Do, 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 do. See if there's anything else we could touch on. But what do you guys think? Give me, give me some thoughts for uh, for Friday. Um, you can hit do you can do it in chat here or through uh, you can message me directly through uh, Twitch. There's a little thing where you can send me a whisper, and that will uh, that way then I can keep all my information because I know a bunch of you have me on some different Discords, uh, some on Facebook, um, some literally just in the next town over, Highcore. Just like that. <laughs> um, yeah, send me um, send me some ideas. Anything we want to do for Friday? Yes, I'm sitting here, listening, waiting. <laughs> Pop Sam possum versus opossum. Oh, we have two votes for the possum versus opossum. Oh, and you, both of you, no. <laughs> about my uh, tick versus possum standings on all of this. So this is going to be a wonderful discussion. So all right, guys, let's plan for Friday, 6 o'clock, West Coast. We'll be talking about opossum and the possum, two different animals and two different thoughts about them. So I'm going to end it off here for now, guys. Thank you for hanging with me. I absolutely appreciate it. Um, if you guys ever get the chance, I do repost these videos on YouTube. So you are more than welcome to go check out my um, YouTube channel. And you can see um, everything that I have uh, discussed before. And um, 
I'm just hoping to keep a log off of it, off of it all. But thank you to all of you. Um, Polar Cave Jew, Ice Tope, Lost Core Core. Thank you all for hanging here. There's one more person here. Who else is here? Who have I not mentioned yet? Who is it? How can I see who's looking at? Where can I see that? Weird, it says I've got four viewers, but I'm seeing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people here. Huh. Interesting. So, anyway, like I say, guys, thank you for tuning in. We'll see you on Friday, 6 p.m. West Coast time. And, um, oh, user's not logged in. That, there we go. That's probably it. I'll figure it out. This is only, what, my fourth stream, so... <clears throat> I'll figure it out. Thanks again, guys. Signing off for now, and I'll see you on Friday.